Good evening. My name is uh, Dr. Timothy Lubinow. I'm an anesthesiologist and uh, pain medicine physician at Rush University Medical Center, where I serve as a program director. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to uh, the fourth in our series of uh, fellows and residents webinar. Uh, this particular uh, series is a series of webinars that is done by residents and fellows, for residents and fellows, and other APPs. Tonight's presentation is entitled Interpretation of MRI Imaging as a Guide for Treatment Options for Lumbar Spinal Stenosis. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Our objectives for tonight are to review some of the minimally invasive treatment options that are in the bailiwick of the interventional pain physician. And we will also uh, touch on and address some of the open lumbar surgical options for lumbar spinal stenosis. So this webinar is gonna review the pertinent aspects of MRI interpretation as it relates to lumbar stenosis. And then following that, our presenters will go and do a deeper dive into each of these different uh, procedures. With that, I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Mansoor Aman. He is a anesthesiologist and interventional pain physician, hospital based in uh, Appleton, Wisconsin. Dr. Rahman, uh, please uh, be welcome. And uh, why don't you begin with the introduction of some of our presenters tonight? Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Dr. Lubinow, thank you for the uh, warm introduction. I'm really excited about today's educational content. Um, we're not only focusing on procedures that are performed by pain physicians, but also reviewing some of the common procedures performed by our surgical colleagues. It's my pleasure to introduce our panelists tonight. Um, we have Dr. Prachi Patel. Uh, she is a PGY-5 and completed her anesthesiology residency at Northwestern University and is currently a pain fellow at Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston. Uh, she will be going over uh, interspinous process fusion devices. We also have tonight Dr. Akash Patel, uh, who is PGY-5. He completed his anesthesia residency at Rush University Medical Center and is a pain fellow with Dr. Lubinow at Rush University. He will be overviewing surgical approaches, including lamentum infusion. And then also tonight will be Dr. Alexandra Moira. She is a senior resident in physical medicine rehabilitation at University of Miami. And she's going to be addressing the intraspinous process decompression techniques of both ver uh, vertiflex and coflex. And then leading off tonight will be Dr. Vinny Franchio, who is a senior resident in physical medicine and rehabilitation at the University of Kansas and plans to stay on there next year. And with that, Dr. Franchio, uh, please uh, continue. All right, good evening. Thank you so much for having me. So I'll be start talking about central canal lumbar spinal stenosis. We'll be reviewing some pictures here. So lumbar spinal stenosis refers to the narrowing of the central canal in the lumbosacral region. It might be due to congenital or acquired causes, degenerative spondylosis, intervertebral disc arrangement, and hypertrophic of the ligamentum flavum, as well as other causes. Two theories exist for the appearance of the ligamentum flavum disease. One is that there are fibrotic changes which result in degenerative cascade, characterized by increased levels of collagen, fiber deposition, reduced amount of elastin, and degeneration of elastin. The second pathomechanism is basically the apparent ligamentum flavum hypertrophy uh, as a result of disc height reduction and disc degeneration leading to a laxity of the ligament, also known as buckling or this redundancy of the ligamentum flavum, leading to basically the folding of the ligamentum flavum on itself. For the purpose of this discussion, we'll basically call ligamentum flavum hypertrophy. Neurogenic claudication is an important hallmark of lumbar spinal stenosis. Low back pain with leg pain, heaviness that is worse by ambulation and standing, relief by forward flexion and rest, our famous shopping cart sign. Lumbar spinal stenosis is a significant contributor to disability in the elderly, leading to lumbar spinal fusion in 5.9 per 100 American within one year of diagnosis. 
Here we have a brief uh, overview of some diagnostic findings or imaging findings of the MRI of central canal stenosis, including facet arthritis, thickening of the ligamentum flavum, and combined with disc herniation for your refreshment based on the previous uh, lectures. We'll talk today about percutaneous image guided lumbar decompression. The mild procedure by Virtus Medical is a minimally invasive percutaneous image guided lumbar decompression intervention that is used to treat lumbar spinal stenosis, particularly associated with ligamentum flavum hypertrophy. So you wanna look for the ligament. Uh, you wanna look for that hypertrophy of the ligament that basically happens in about 85% of the cases that contributes to spinal stenosis. And the starting point that you're looking at is 2.5 millimeters. Clinical indications include the evidence of ligamentum flavum hypertrophy greater than 2.5 millimeters. There are no age restrictions, neurogenic claudication and a shopping cart sign. Failure to conservative therapy, such as physical therapy, medications, and injections, and no lumbar spinal surgery within the previous 12 months, such as laminectomy, laminotomy, fusion, or other kinds of uh, interspinal spaces or decompression. Some additional considerations that are important to keep in mind is that it must be it's compatible with all lumbar spinal levels. It may be an option for those who are not able to tolerate a spinal fusion, such as high VMI anesthesia intolerance, diabetes, and he also may be using uh, patients with adjacent level disease uh, with hardware, spondylolisthesis grade less than two, and osteopenia. Contraindications will include prior spinal surgery at the level of treatment, localized infection or uh, systemic infection, spondylolisthesis grade three and above, and also coagulopathy or bleeding disorders. Keep in mind, this is just some general pointers for you to understand the principle of this intervention. Let's briefly look into the procedure. This is a minimally invasive lumbar decompression procedure under fluoroscopy guidance. Usually outpatient under MAC anesthesia, obviously this is based on the physician preference. It's a single midline incision, small entry point, uh, use an entry point of 5.1 millimeters to access the multiple treatment zones. Two basic main instruments, the rondure to remove the bone, uh, and access the ligament as well as the tissue sculpture to the bulk of the ligament flavor. Uh, there is a blunt tip instrument that allows for good safety profile and the safety profile is considered similar to an epidural steroid injection. Uh, there are no implants with this procedure, uh, no major structural anatomy alteration and less than 0.1% adverse event rate. Patients typically will resume their normal activity within the first 24 hours after the interventions with no major restrictions. This is a typical um, set when you are doing this procedure that you'll see in your practice. I have here some uh, pictures of the procedure, just diagram with fluoroscopy pictures so you can have an idea about this intervention. So basically you have the insertion uh, insert port 5.1 millimeters. Uh, you'll basically get into the uh, lamina and the ligamentum flavum. You'll remove the bone to achieve access. You'll debulk the ligamentum flavum, and then you remove the instruments. You have the pictures on the bottom left showing the fluoroscopy uh, imaging with the bone scopal, uh, scopal rangor and the tissue sculptor. And then the pictures on the bottom right, uh, it's kind of going over the uh, epidurogram which used to be a recommendation, but there's some evidence that suggests that an epidurogram is not particularly necessary for safety, uh, comparing uh, this intervention with the epidurogram and without epidurogram, the safety profile was basically the same. Um, also important to know that there's some evidence in, from 2016 that there's no difference in safety profile with the uh, lumbar epidural steroid injection and this procedure. So you want to think about three things, excess, debulk, and stop. Three bites up, three bites down. Uh, debulk, you're going to do three, uh, three scoops, uh, and then stop. You're going to identify your target zone, decompress that area, uh, so you minimize any risk of damage. We're going to cover some very basic evidence here from a study in pain medicine, um, the motion study. So this was published in 2020, uh, this last year, 22, there's level one evidence with real world outcomes. 
This is a prospective multi-center randomized clinical trial combining with this therapy and non-surgical therapy versus non-surgical therapy alone. Uh, they followed up these patients for about one year. Uh, there were no adverse side effects reported in either group, and the statistical significance and superiority was in favor of the intervention compared to medical treatment with improved in all outcomes, including pain scores, claudication score, scores, disability scores. Um, so they suggest that this is an effective intervention early in the treatment algorithm uh, in addition to conservative therapy. Looking at another study published in 2021 at pain practice, uh, also suggests similar, similar results that this offers durable uh, relief up to five years, uh, and it may even actually avoid lumbar spinal decompression surgery with this study published in 2021. We have the best practice guidelines, the MISC guidelines by the American Society of Pain Neuroscience. This was a consensus guidelines published in 2022 that evaluated the quality of evidence uh, and then we have two level one randomized control clinical trials with several level two prospective control studies. Uh, the general consensus is this intervention should be considered for the treatment of mild to moderate lumbar spinal stenosis in the presence of neurogenic claudication with less than or equal to grade two spondylolisthesis and with a contribution of uh, spinal canal narrowing because of at least 2.5 millimeters of ligamentum flavum hypertrophy. Again, this is a great A recommendation with a high certainty that the net benefit is substantial and the available evidence is from well-designed, well-randomized clinical studies with a level 1A evidence. To summarize our clinical evidence, we have level 1 data from real-world outcomes up to five-year durability with significant functional improvement in disability scores, in pain scores, and walking scores, claudication scores. And the safety profile of this intervention is equivalent to an epidural steroid injection. All right, my name is Alex Morera. Um, today I'll be talking about Vertiflex and Coflex. Next slide, please. So the FDA approved Vertiflex, the superior inner spinous spacer, in 2015. It's an H-shaped implant composed of titanium alloy and is a standalone spacer that functions as an extension blocker to minimize the extent of compression uh, of the neural elements, particularly in the lateral recess and foramina. Insertion of the spacer is performed percutaneously without surgical removal of tissue adjacent to the dura or exiting nerves. Next slide, please. So this is intended for patients with neurogenic claudication, secondary to moderate degenerative lumbar spinal stenosis with up to grade one spondylolisthesis. It can be used at one or two adjacent levels from L1 to L5. Indicated for patients with physical, uh, impaired physical function who've experienced relief and flexion from symptoms of leg, buttock, and groin pain with or without back pain and who have undergone at least six months of non-operative treatment. It also makes it possible for a larger group of patients um, who maybe don't want or can't tolerate general anesthesia um, or an extensive lumbar surgery, especially in the prone position. Next slide, please. So it's contraindicated in patients with spinal anatomy that simply just prevents implantation of the device or can cause the device to be unstable in situ. So this is contraindicated in patients with greater than grade one spondylolisthesis, cotoquinus syndrome, and prior decompression or fusion at the index level. Next slide, please. So in 2017, uh, there was a study published in the Journal of Clinical Interventions in Aging. This was level one evidence with real world outcomes. It was an FDA non-inferiority multi-center randomized control trial with 391 subjects with lumbar spinal stenosis and neurogenic claudication. This looked at five-year outcome data and compared two interspinous process spacers. Of the 190 patients randomized to receive the treatment, 75% of them were free from reoperation, revision, or supplemental fixation at their index level of five years. 
inter, uh, interspinous process decompression patients demonstrated significant improvement over their baseline um, in all Zurich claudication questionnaire uh, areas, specifically patient satisfaction, uh, leg pain and back pain improvement, uh, patient performance, um, and ODI, which was all significant. And at the five-year follow-up, um, inner spinous process decompression with a standalone spacer provided sustained clinical benefit. Next slide, please. So alluding to the 22 consensus guidelines that ASIN published um, in the Journal of Pain Research, uh, this was an evidence-based document outlining clinical guidelines for interventional treatments of low back pain. And it addressed specifically the appropriateness, effectiveness, and safety of interventional pain procedures. Evaluated the quality of the evidence in the literature using the U.S. Preventative uh, Services Task Force criteria and evaluated levels of certainty regarding this benefit. So the consensus stand, uh, uh, statement on regarding standalone interspinous spacers for indirect indirect decompression is that it is a safe and effective treatment for the mild to moderate lumbar spinal stenosis if there are no contraindications present. It's a grade A level 1A uh, with a high level of certainty net benefit. This was based on a one, one multi-center RCT and three RCT follow-up studies as well as two prospective single arm observational studies. Next slide please. So in summary, this device preserves the anatomy. It doesn't limit future treatment options, uh, including STEM, radiofrequency, ESI, no, no use of general anesthesia, small incision, less operative time, no blood loss, and a very low rate of serious peri and post-operative complications. Uh, there's also been no deep wound infections to date. Next slide, please. So the CoFlex inner laminar stabilization implant is another type of minimally invasive uh, treatment option. And it is made from alloy uh, and designed to fit between two adjacent spinous processes in the lumbar spine. It appears as a U-shape on lateral radiograph, as you can see below on the bottom left. The clips are staggered such that the superior clips are more anterior. And it's intended to be used and implanted after decompression of the canal has been performed and at the affected levels. The device provides dynamic stabilization as it compresses on the lumbar extension, but also permits um, flexion while providing relative distraction of the posterior elements throughout the range of motion. Next slide, please. It's indicated um, and has been shown to be analogous to decompression infusion when treating moderate uh, spinal stenosis. It also provides dynamic stability and preserves normal spine range of motion after decompression is performed without the rigidity that patients feel with pedicle screw fixation. Contraindicated in patients with osteoporosis, spinous process fractures, axial back pain only without leg or buttock or groin pain, prior fusion, um, at the index level, lumbar compression fracture, if the patient has severe facet hypertrophy necessitating bone excision leading to instability, that's also contraindicated. Also, um, uh, greater than grade two uh, spondylolisthesis um, and lumbar scoliosis and BMI greater than 40 is contraindicated. Next slide, please. So in 2013, there was a study published in Spine which was a prospective non-inferiority multi-center randomized control trial with 392 subjects with moderate to severe lumbar spinal stenosis neuro and with neurogenic claudication and up to grade one spondylolisthesis. Coflex proved and demonstrated to have uh, shorter surgical times, reduced hospital length of stay, less blood loss compared with instrumented spinal fusion. At two years, uh, there was significant improvement seen within the CoFlex cohort compared to the fusion uh, in all Zurich claudication questionnaire subdomains, as well as SF12, which is a functional survey. Um, and there was a significant trend uh, seen with the OS3 disability index survey as well. So based on the strict FDA criteria for overall success of this device that was explained in this paper, 
Coflex succeeded in about 66% of patients compared with 57% of fusions at two years, which uh, demonstrated non-inferiority. And in, 27, in 2016, a study published in the International Journal of Spine Surgery, um, which was a five-year follow-up study from a randomized control trial comparing decompression plus coflex versus decompression plus posterior lateral fusion. The results of this study supported that decompression and interlaminar stabilization is an effective sustainable treatment option for moderate to severe spinal stenosis and not an inevitable precursor to fusion. Also, the interlaminar stabilization after decompression procedure outcomes uh, were similar to, or superior to fusion with pedicle screws. There is also findings of uh, highlighting in this paper that the, the two that two level decompression and interlaminar stabilization procedures had a significantly lower rate of revision and then fusion procedures. And the reduction of VAS uh, back and leg pain were significant um, in both uh, groups. Next slide, please. So in summary of this device, um, it, it seems to provide similar uh, patient reported clinical outcomes of a fusion procedure while maintaining motion at the operative and adjacent levels. Um, it also maintains foraminal height, preserving the durability of a surgical decompression and provides uh, immediate and long-term leg and back pain relief. It also requires less time in the operating room, less blood loss, less days in the hospital compared to a fusion, and um, also offers faster relief of symptoms and quicker recovery. Next slide. Good evening, my name is Prachi Patel and I'll be going over interspinous process fixation devices. The goal of these devices is to address not only the spinal stenosis, but coexisting degeneration that interspinous facers cannot. These devices have been around for many years and by no means is this a comprehensive talk. It's a broad topic and this is meant to be more of an overview and going over some of the data that's out there. To briefly review, interspinous process fixation devices, as the name suggests, are positioned between spinous processes and are designed to be implanted with bone graft material to promote fusion. The goal is to stabilize adjacent spinous processes and decompress neural structures by limiting lumbar extension. On the left side are images of the Minuteman device and its implantation procedure. The device is intended for use in the non-cervical spine, so T1 through S1 levels for spinal stenosis, degenerative disc disease, and spondylolisthesis. It's designed to be implanted posteriorly at any level from T1 to S1 or can be implanted laterally in the lumbar spine. At the top right is the Spire spinal system by Medtronic that can be placed by spine surgeons for posterior stabilization as a supplement to another fusion method such as inner body fusion. It's indicated for degenerative disc disease, spondylolisthesis, spinal stenosis, scoliosis, or other spinal curvatures. And at the bottom right here, we have the InSpan device it has two plates with staggered spikes and an interlocking hub. It's approved for similar indications in the non-cervical spine. Next slide, please. This is the Aurora Zip implant that was developed as an alternative to pedicle screw fixation. It too is designed for use in the non-cervical spine and has a space here in the middle for graft material. Next slide, please. In terms of indications, Interspinous process fixation devices are indicated for patients with symptomatic mild to moderate spinal stenosis, degenerative spine and disc disease with grade two spondylolisthesis or less. These devices are contraindicated in cauda equina syndrome or in cases of spinous fracture. Relative contraindications or cases that require more caution include severe osteoporosis, pars interarticularis defects or translational instability. The main concern here being fracture of the spinous processes. Next slide, please. We'll review the literature on this, but I wanna start by reviewing the factors to consider when evaluating these fixation devices. 
One of the cited advantages of interspinous process fixation as opposed to an open fusion include the minimally invasive approach, which involves smaller skin incisions with less muscle dissection, shorter operative times with reduced blood loss and faster recovery. In terms of outcomes, some studies report comparable improvement in pain scores, disability index scores, and fusion rates compared to open surgical fixation. Risks to consider include spinous process fracture, fusion failure, and as with any spine intervention, nerve damage and infection. Next slide, please. This is a busy table, but it includes the relevant studies that I'm gonna cover in this talk. While I was unable to find prospective randomized controlled trials evaluating the efficacy of interspinous fixation alone, these devices, or sorry, these studies suggest interspinous fixation in combination with lumbar decompression or other surgical interventions is effective and may carry lower intraop risk, so should be considered, especially for patients with other medical comorbidities that may prevent them from getting an open fusion. Next slide, please. Starting off with the data on procedural benefits. This data is from a retrospective study that compared 21 patients who underwent anterior lumbar inner body fusion and spire plate implant at a single lumbar level and compared them to 11 patients who had an ALIF with bilateral transpedicular screw fixation. In this chart here, the purple is the interspinous fixation device group and the gray is the pedicle screw fixation. They found that spinous process fixation was associated with 50% less blood loss and shorter operative times, which was attributed to the smaller exposure required. However, they did not address the statistical significance of these findings, and there was no demonstrated difference in the length of hospital stay. Next slide, please. Many of the published studies on these devices have looked at their use as an adjunct to other surgical fusion techniques. For example, this retrospective study looked at patients who underwent posterior lumbar inner body fusion with either interspinous fixation with a spire plate or with pedicle screw fixation. The study consisted of 40 patients in the IFD group and 36 patients in the pedicle screw group. In terms of disease process, majority either had lumbar spinal stenosis or grade one spondylolisthesis and instrumentation was most frequently performed at the lower lumbar M levels. The MRI images up top here show an example of a patient with L4-5 spinal stenosis who then went on to have a posterior lumbar inner body fusion and a spire plate as shown on the x-rays below. Next slide please. So similar to earlier data, operative time and EBL was significantly lower in the IFD group, but the average length of hospital stay was not significantly different between these two groups. They looked at visual analog scale or VAS scores and the Korean Oswestry Disability Index or ODI scores, both at pre-op, post-op, and one year post-op. In the interspinous fixation group um, represented here on the left, VAS scores decreased from an average of seven at pre-op to 1.3 at the one year mark. On the right, the pedicle screw fixation group had VAS scores go down from eight to 1.2. ODI scores also improved comparably at the one-year mark for both groups. There was no statistically significant difference in these outcomes between the two groups. Next slide, please. The study also looked at range of motion and degenerative changes at adjacent levels with dynamic and static x-rays. Both groups demonstrated a statistically significant decrease in range of motion at 12 months post-op. However, the pedicle screw group also resulted in an increased segmental motion at the adjacent level located cranially or above the instrumented level. One of the concerns with posterior fusion is that it may cause increased motion and place additional force or stress at the facet joints of adjacent levels. The number of patients with adjacent segment disease as shown in the table here below was 60% lower in the IFD group compared to the pedicle screw group and this was a significant difference. The charts on the right show bony fusion rates of the two groups. Fusion rates were similar between the two with a rate of about 92%. So overall, this study demonstrated decreased EBL and operative time with the use of IFDs with comparable stabilization as pedicle screw fixation. There were similar improvements in VAS and ODI scores and decreased range of motion. 
However, the IFD group also demonstrated a lower rate of adjacent segment degeneration. Next slide, please. And just to quickly mention the complications that they reported in this study, in the IFD group, one patient has sustained back pain and lumbar CT showed fusion failure and fracture of the L4 inferior articular process as shown in the images here. Another two patients had retropulsion of the inner body cage and required reoperation. There were no major surgery related complications such as deep infection, nerve root injury, or CSF leakage. Of the 36 patients in the pedicle screw group, there were three cases of deep infection, two cases of CSF leakage, and one case of a post-op epidural hematoma, which required reoperation. Next slide. Another study that looked into fusion rates was this retrospective study of 86 elderly patients, the mean age was 67 years, that looked at interspinous fixation with the Aspen device for patients with spinal stenosis, degenerative disc disease, scoliosis, or spondylolisthesis. While 48% of these patients underwent interspinous fixation alone, some patients also had a combination of unilateral pedicle screw fixation and or inner body fusion, either by transraminal, anterior, or lateral approach. They reported sustained improvements in VAS scores post-procedure with an average score decrease of 3.6 points at the six to 12 month mark post-op. However, there was no comparison group for this analysis. Looking at the chart on the right, 50 of the patients representing 53 individual lumbar levels had post-procedure CT images reviewed by an independent radiologist. On average, the scans were done approximately six months post-op. 94% of the levels demonstrated grade three or grade four interspinous process fusion, with grade three indicating some solid incorporation and bridging bone, and grade four showing solid fusion. This is similar to the fusion rate of about 92% that we saw in the previous study. Of note, within this study, they did observe two fractures of the spinous process or lamina, both of which required device explantation. Next slide, please. This is a retrospective single surgeon case series of 122 patients who underwent open lumbar decompression and interspinous fixation using the InSpan device at the L4-5 level. At two-year follow-up, mean VAS and ODI scores improved, both with statistical significance. Of these 122 patients, one required removal of the InSpan device and a hemilaminectomy for further decompression. There were no spinal fractures, implant failures, or implant dislocations over the five-year period. Next slide, please. In this prospective cohort study, 25 patients with lumbar spinal stenosis, sorry, are we able to advance to the next slide? Perfect. So this was a prospective cohort study, 25 patients with lumbar stenosis and chronic radiculopathy with grade one lumbar spondylolisthesis who underwent either unilateral or bilateral laminotomy and placement of an interspinous fixation device with bone graft. Um, Post-op x-rays and CTs were reviewed to evaluate the degree of fusion and CT scan ultimately confirmed that there was certain fusion in 21 of the 25 patients. If we're able to go just back to the previous slide, there were images at the bottom which showed an example of this fusion. Um, if we're not able to, we can move on. So looking at this table here, they collected outcome measures using NRS or numerical rating scale scores, ODI scores, and a short form general survey which asks about pain and physical function. For patients that had radiographic evidence of fusion, NRS scores decreased by about 60% for low back pain, 80% for leg pain, ODI scores decreased by 50%, and the health survey scores improved by 50%. Of course, the major limitation of this study and many studies published on these devices is that there was no control group. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, while there hasn't been very much data published on interspinous fixation and fusion devices alone, this is data from a recently published retrospective case series of 32 patients who underwent implantation of the Aurora Zip device in an outpatient setting. Patients in the study were experiencing low back pain and neurogenic claudication symptoms with imaging demonstrating moderate to severe lumbar stenosis at at least one level. 
For all patients, demineralized bone matrix graft was utilized inside the barrel of the device to promote bone effusion. At 90 days, there was a significant reduction in pain scores with average VAS scores decreasing from 8.1 to 2.65 at the three month follow-up. And there were no adverse events or revisions required. Next slide, please. To summarize, the data that we do have suggests interspinous fixation devices can achieve comparable improvements in outcomes such as VAS scores, ODI scores, and fusion rates as pedicle screw fixation, with the additional benefit of having lower EBL and operative times, which is beneficial for patients with other medical comorbidities, which may preclude an open fusion. One study also demonstrated lower adjacent segment disease compared to pedicle screw fixation. And this is another potential benefit of these devices. Prospective controlled randomized trials would be helpful in better understanding the efficacy and role of these devices, as would having longer follow-up periods and more well-defined indications. Majority of studies so far have looked at IFD in combination with other fusion techniques and lumbar decompression techniques. So further research is needed to evaluate interspinous fixation devices as standalone devices. Next slide, please. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. My name is Akash Patel, and I'm one of the interventional pain fellows at Rush University Medical Center. My main, next slide, please. My main objective for this section of the lecture is to do a brief overview of the different surgical interventions that are um, surgical colleagues can offer our patients for lumbar spinal stenosis. As pain physicians, we're going to be working hand in hand with spine surgeons, um, whether it's treating patients before or after a large spine surgery. So it's imperative that we as pain physicians are aware of the implications of these different surgeries. The procedures that I'll be touching on today include the lumbar laminectomy, followed by various approaches to lumbar inner body fusion. So to start, the lumbar laminectomy is a common procedure um, used to decompress not only the central canal, but also the lateral recesses and neuroforamina. It involves resecting the spinous process and lamina up until the medial borders of the facet joints. This can be done either unilaterally or bilaterally, and it can be done in either a minimally invasive or open technique. As you can see in the axial images on the bottom, on the far left, you have um, a basic um, vertebrae with the anatomy label. In the center, you have a patient who underwent a complete or bilateral laminectomy. Um, and as you can see, the patient suffered from pretty severe spinal stenosis and the central canal more than doubled in size. On the far right, you see a patient who's underwent a unilateral or hemilaminectomy. Um, and once again, the results have been similar with significant improvement in central canal size. Next slide, please. Some of the indications for a lumbar laminectomy, like I mentioned earlier, are central, lateral recess, and neuroforaminal stenosis, but it has to be associated with some sort of neurological deficit or intractable pain. As pain physicians, we're all aware that um, spinal stenosis can be multifactorial, whether it be congenital or acquired through de degenerative changes. Some of the contraindications for a lumbar laminectomy revolve around spinal instability. Spinal instability is caused by multiple factors as well, including severe scoliosis, severe kyphosis, or high-grade spondylolisthesis. In these patients, a lumbar laminectomy can still be performed, but it must be associated with some sort of form of lumbar fusion in order to regain that stability. One of the papers I want to talk about is the SPORT trial. This is a landmark study that looked at surgical um, decompressive laminectomies for lumbar spinal stenosis versus non-surgical conservative management for lumbar spinal stenosis. This was a randomized controlled multi-center trial um, that followed patients for a total of four years. Along those four years, it measured multiple metrics um, for pain as well as functional status. And ultimately, the study concluded that patients who suffered from symptomatic spinal stenosis treated surgically via decompressive laminectomy compared to those treated non-operatively or conservatively, had statistically significant um, greater improvement in not only pain, but also function through that four-year mark. Next slide, please. Next, I would like to focus on majority of our discussion on the different approaches to lumbar fusion. Throughout my anesthesia residency, I was always confused why 
um, certain spine surgeons would choose an anterior lumbar inner body fusion versus a posterior lumbar inner body fusion. So my goal of this section of the lecture is to hopefully give you all a better understanding of the differences between these approaches. For starters, all lumbar inner body fusions involve some sort of removal or dissection of the intervertebral disc and implantation of either a cage, spacer, or graft into this void. For all intensive purposes of this lecture, all three of those are the same and will be used interchangeably. There are several approaches to a lumbar inner body fusion, and that's how they're named. The name of a lumbar inner body fusion is in relation to the transverse process. An anterior lumbar inner body fusion, therefore, is an anterior approach to the intervertebral disc, anterior to the transverse process. Similarly, a posterior lumbar inner body fusion is a posterior approach posterior to the transverse process. There's no clear evidence that one form of fusion is superior to another form of fusion, only that there's clear indications and contraindications to each of these procedures. Next slide, please. The posterior lumbar inner body fusion was the original form of fusion originally discovered in the 1940s. Since then, technology has advanced and the procedure has been modified and now um, improved significantly. Um, the procedure is done, um, as the name implies, from a posterior approach, posterior to the transverse process. As such, the patient is placed under general anesthesia and positioned in the prone position. Once this is done, a midline incision is typically made. The erector spinae musculature is dissected off the bony prominences and a formalized laminectomy is performed. Once that's done, the spinal cord and major nerve roots are retracted out of the way in order to, for the surgeon to have access to the posterior intervertebral discs. Once that's done, the disc is dissected out and a graft, spacer, or cage is implanted. Finally, the patient is typically fused posteriorly using pedicle screws and rods, as you can see in the x-ray image. Next slide, please. Some of the indications for a posterior lumbar inner body fusion are predominantly discogenic pain as well as degenerative disc disease. Similarly, recurrent disc herniation, spondylolisthesis, um, and symptomatic spinal stenosis are also indications. The contraindications to a lumbar, um, a posterior lumbar inner body fusion are predominantly patients who have had extensive back surgery resulting in epidural scarring, which could cause some complications. The other contraindications are the basic contraindications to any surgical procedure, mainly being systemic infections, local side infections, or bleeding issues. Some of the advantages of this approach is the fact that it is a traditional approach, and most neurospine surgeons and orthospine surgeons are comfortable performing it. It allows for direct visualization of the spinal cord, as well as major nerve roots, allowing for direct decompression. Some of the downsides of this procedure are inherent to the procedure itself. Mainly, dissecting through the director's spinae muscles is very painful and usually causes longer recovery periods and a more painful recovery. Similarly, prolonged retraction of the spinal cord or major nerve roots can result in iatrogenic compression injury to these structures, as well as increased risk of dural tears. Similarly, in the posterior lumbar inner body fusion, patients have um, more difficulty correcting um, coronal imbalances, and there's higher rates of adjacent level um, disease in the future. Next slide, please. The next approach that I wanna discuss is the transforaminal lumbar inner body fusion. This is a modified version of the posterior approach created to mitigate the complications of the posterior approach. As such, since it is a modified version of a posterior approach, the patient is once again under general anesthesia in the prone position, um, but there are two paramedian incisions made. Typically, a unilateral laminectomy or a unilateral facetectomy is performed, and since the surgeon is coming at an angle and not perfectly posterior, a special sh banana-shaped um, intervertebral spacer is typically placed. Following this, the patient is fused posteriorly with pedicle screws and rods as well. Next slide, please. The indications and contraindications for a transforaminal lumbar inner body fusions are the same as a posterior approach. The advantages of this approach is the fact that there's less manipulation of posterior structures compared to the posterior lumbar inner body fusion. As such, since you're not dissecting through the erector spinae muscles as much, there's faster recovery and it's less painful. 
Furthermore, since you are sparing the contralateral lamina and the spinous process, there's more posterior structures which allow for greater fusion rates due to the larger footprint. Similarly, the disadvantages of the T-lift procedure um, are once again difficulty correcting coronal imbalances and relatively high rates of um, adjacent level disease. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The next approach I want to discuss is the anterior lumbar interbody fusion. As the name suggests, it's an anterior approach anterior to the transverse process. As such, the patient is typically put under general anesthesia in the supine position. Next, a midline, paramedian, or mini C-section incision is made, depending on the level the surgeon is targeting. Once that's done, the retroperitoneal and peritoneal organs must be identified, vascular structures must be identified, and retracted out of the way, allowing the surgeon access to the anterior disc. Once that's done, the anterior disc is completely removed, um, allowing for a complete discectomy, unlike a posterior lumbar interbody fusion or a trans um, foraminal lumbar interbody fusion. One of the benefits of doing a complete discectomy is the ability to implant a larger spacer or cage. As you can see in option A and the Im X-ray images on the left, with the larger cage, you're able to implant the screws directly through the cage. Option B on the right shows an independent construct. Even though there's a larger spacer, the surgeon utilized a separate plate and screw system to fuse anteriorly. Next slide, please. The indications for an A-lift procedure are predominantly L4, L5 disc disease and L5, S1 disc disease. Some of the contraindications unique to the anterior lumbar interbody fusion are inherent to the procedure itself. Since it does require abdominal access, any history of extensive abdominal surgery is a contraindication to this procedure. As we all know, patients who've had extensive abdominal surgeries have adhesions and there's higher risk of damaging viscera as well as vascular structures. On a similar note, atypical vascular anatomy is also a relative contraindication to this approach due to the risk of injuring these vessels um, on exposure. Some of the advantages of the anterior lumbar interbody fusion, like I mentioned earlier, are the fact that you are able to do, perform a complete discectomy. With a complete discectomy and the ability to place a larger cage or a spacer, it allows greater height restoration, greater correction of corona and sagittal imbalances, and restoration of lumbar lordosis. Furthermore, it allows for greater fusion rates because of the larger footprint, and the fact that you didn't manipulate any of the posterior structures allows for lower risks of adjacent level disease in the future. Some of the disadvantages of this approach is the fact that you are approaching from the abdomen. Most neurosurgeons and orthopedic spine surgeons are not accustomed to operating in the abdomen, and as such, a general surgeon is typically required for exposure. Furthermore, um, there's higher risk of damaging um, retroperitoneal um, structures and vascular structures via this approach compared to the posterior approaches. Next slide, please. The final approach that I want to discuss today is the lateral lumbar inner body fusion or extreme lateral lumbar inner body fusion. In this, in this approach, the patient is placed under general anesthesia in the lateral to cubitus position with the operative side facing up. A minimally invasive technique is used um, to treat multiple levels and a trans psoas approach is taken. Once the, once the surgeon is at the desired disc level, the disc is dissected laterally um, and replaced with a spacer or cage. The patient can be fused unilaterally with um, screws and rods as well um, or a plate system. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The main indications for the lateral lumbar inner body fusion or extreme lateral lumbar inner body fusion is disc disease from T12 to L5, as well as scoliosis. Some of the contraindications are similar to the anterior approach since you are approaching from a retroperitoneal <coughs> approach. Um, extensive abdominal surgery is a contraindication for the same reason. Some of the advantages of this approach is the fact that um, you have good correction of sagittal and coronal imbalances, especially in scoliotic patients. Furthermore, because it is a minimally invasive technique, um, there's rapid post-op mobilization and it's less painful. 
furthermore, there's a higher fusion rate because of the um, of the less manipulation of the posterior structures. One of the main disadvantages of this approach is the fact that you cannot treat the L5-S1 level due to um, the iliac crest obstructing the area. Furthermore, there's risk of damaging iliac vessels and retroperitoneal structures. And most importantly, there's a risk of damaging the lumbar plexus, which is unique to this approach. As such, neuromonitoring is typically required. Next slide, please. And with that, I want to leave you guys with this summary slide. Um, it just is a brief summary in a table format of each of the approaches we just discussed, some of the advantages and drawbacks of each of them, and then a little cartoon of the different incisions and the positioning of the patient. And with that, I thank you for joining us tonight, and I'll open a, the field up to Dr. Lubna and Dr. Ahmad. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Those were uh, excellent presentations, and uh, we have some time for uh, questions here. I have one question for Dr. Morera first. Uh, could you give us an example of um, one of the types of questions that is uh, asking the zeroclaudication uh, scale, the zeroclaudication questionnaire? And do you feel, uh, is this something that we should be keeping as part of our electronic medical record when we see these lumbar spinal stenosis patients in the office? Absolutely, so thanks for the question, great question. Um, so I think that, so the Zurich Claudication Questionnaire Survey is comprised of seven items for symptom severity with scores of one to five five items evaluating functional disability with scores of one to four. And then there's about six items on this questionnaire that addresses the treatment satisfaction with scores of one to four. Patients with higher scores indicate more severe lumbar spinal stenosis. And for example, uh, one of the typical questions that could be seen on this type of survey is uh, basically there was a question in the past month how would you describe the pain in your legs or feet? One of the options would be none, mild, moderate, severe, and extreme. Those are kind of the, the types of questions you can see on, on that survey. And I think it's very important to include this in the EHR to monitor patients' progress, whether it's you know just clinically or also for research purposes. All right, very good. Uh, we have a question from the audience. And uh, this question is with regard to the mild procedure. The question reads, what is the appropriateness of a mild procedure being repeated at the level of a prior mild procedure? And uh, Dr. Francio, uh, would you care to um, answer this one? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. Uh, thanks for asking that. Um, so. I think the most appropriate answer uh, would be no, uh, since there has been structural changes at that level. Uh, we are removing the posterior fibers from of the ligamentum flavum that are calcified, so you are changing the anatomy. Um, so I think because you are changing the structural anatomy of that level, uh, I would not necessarily repeat at that same level since you are basically now uh, too close to the anterior aspect of the ligamentum flavum or to the spinal cord, so you can have that lo false loss of resistance. But obviously, it's uh, very, um, it's very. Um, there's multiple factors that play a role, so it's important to repeat an MRI. We have to look into the absolute contraindications with instrumentation and prior sp spinal surgery. And I think, um, based on my uh, discussions with the company that uh, offered this intervention, they have mentioned that. Uh, it has happened sporadically uh, in the past with some patients that have return of symptoms uh, after five, six, eight, ten years. And uh, some physicians may have done that in the past, but I think the general consensus is that because we have changed the structural anatomy of that ligamentum flavum, uh, most likely we will not proceed with that intervention at that level uh, before, uh, before doing any other uh, con clinical considerations. All right, Dr. Rahman, uh, could would you care to ask a question? Absolutely. So there's actually another question from the audience regarding the mild procedure, and that's um, how do you know when it's too much bite, and um, you know when do you know to stop? 
Vinny, do you want to uh, take a stab at that and I can chime in as well? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's always, uh, particularly when you're starting like me, you know, when we're in fellowship and we are in the first year of practice, it's always uh, better to be more conservative and safer uh, and uh, really understand how much we can take out and making sure that we are within that safety zone that we have uh, and understanding with good preoperative planning, look at the MRI, knowing where's more of that thickness of that ligamentum flavum so we can really know that that level that we are choosing to treat or a couple levels that we are treating uh, is the exactly area that we want. So if you have an area with four or five millimeters versus three millimeters, and also associate that with clinical symptoms if that match your neurogenic claudication. So obviously I would start more conservative. I would follow the protocol that the company suggests uh, with the three bites and you know scoop and things like that and kind of reassess and see how things are going uh, and, and go from there. That would be the, my, my decision at this time. I agree with you and I'll kind of um, summarize that in two aspects as well. You can choose to do an epidurogram and that will kind of clearly highlight a margin of safety. That's one approach. And having done hundreds of these cases, um, when you have taken enough bites out of the ligament flavum, you eventually stop getting um, ligament back. And that's kind of a good indicator of this is a good time for us to stop. Uh, Dr. Prachi Patel, I have another question for you. So you had discussed uh, interspinous process uh, fusion devices. So the question is, if someone was to have a fracture of their spinous process during placement, how do you deal with that? How do you manage this? Because, you know, this device is sitting between two spinous processes. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I think ultimately it depends on the situation. Um, if the patient is asymptomatic, you can leave the device, let the fracture heal, let it scar down. However, if there's any pain associated with the device compressing on the fracture, it would be best to remove it. Regardless with the fracture, the device is not providing the intended support to address the original source of pain. And so then the decision is, do you treat them conservatively or do you send them to a spine surgeon for a more typical fusion? Great. Yeah, I totally agree. And Akash, I'm going to throw one question at you as well. Uh, you did a great job talking about laminectomy and fusion approaches. Um, as a pain physician, we deal with these patients in our office post-operatively. Um, someone that walks into my clinic that has had, that has had a fusion operation, um, how important is it for me to be aware of proximal junctional kyphosis or adjacent segment disease in this patient population? Absolutely, absolutely. And like I mentioned, we are going to be working with these surgeons hand in hand. We're going to see these same patients either before or after um, lumbar spine surgery. So those numbers are very important to put to our patients so they know what they're getting themselves into and what to kind of expect. So for a, it's a very debated topic, but in general, um, the ballpark is around 20 to 30 percent risk of adjacent level disease. Um, after a spine surgery. Um, and that's usually at that five, um, anywhere between that and the five year mark is typically the number that most papers agree upon. Great. Yep. And then there's one last question here. I'd like to pose this to Dr. Marrera. And the question is in the clinical setting of lumbar stenosis at L5S1, um, is the vertiflex procedure something that is uh, able to be performed or um, is this something that's uh, better served with a mild procedure? Great question. Um, I believe from what I read um, in the literature is primarily used uh, reserved from L1 to L5. Um, I don't know if um, maybe Dr. Rahman or Dr. Luminal, you care to chime in, um, but I, my understanding is um, that it's it's not typically appropriate for L5-S1. Yes, the is that uh, you need to have a caudate spinous process. And um, for the most part, the um, spinous process at S1 is really just a remnant of bone. Uh, very occasionally, you might have a spinous process as S1 is capable of receiving the caudate aspect of the um, Rotoflex implant, but for the most part, this is something that's meant to be done from L1 through L5, but not through to the S1 level. 
With that, I'd like to thank uh, everybody for their uh, kind participation. I'd like to thank the audience members for uh, listening in. Could you forward to the next slide, please, Lakin? So we have reviewed the uh, MRI images pertinent to lumbar spinal stenosis. We have had an excellent review of some of the minimally invasive spinal procedures that exist in our Bialyoikas pain phys uh, physicians, as well as the uh, uh, open lumbar surgical procedures. I'd like to uh, point out that we will have a fifth and final Aspen webinar, April 25th. That particular webinar is going to be dealing with, uh, again, interpretation of lumbar MRI images, but specifically for degenerative disc disease and its application to the minimally invasive spinal procedures that we can perform. Uh, chiefly, we're going to be focused on BVN ablation or some of the regenerative medicine options. Next slide. And then finally, I'd like to remind all of our listeners that the 5th Annual Aspen Conference is going to be held this year in Miami Beach, July 13th through the 16th. It promises to be an excellent event. Uh, we're um, anticipating a large turnout. We have uh, reserved the entire hotel for our meeting, and uh, I would... Um, just ask everybody to uh, make set some time aside to uh, attend. It will be a great learning venture. <clears throat> Last slide, please. With that, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Mon, all of our presenters tonight. Everyone did a great job. And with that, we wish everyone uh, a good night, and we will see you again at our next Aspen webinar. Thank you. Thank you.